Welcome back to renowned physicist, Dr. Jeremy England, former professor of physics at MIT, author of Every Life is on Fire, currently a machine learning researcher in the biotech industry here in Israel. Good evening, Dr. England. Shalom. Uh, so I, I was looking forward this evening to trying to discuss a topic that I think in one sense, still a little bit half formed, but I think there are some solid points to make and it connects to the recent parasha and the annual cycle, um, parashat Vaishlach. Uh, so we'll get there eventually. Uh, but the question I wanna start off with uh, is, in one sense, uh, one for which we have a simple answer, which is that according to the Torah, who wrote the Torah? And, and the simple answer that we have, obviously, is that Moshe Rabbeinu received the Torah from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and he wrote it down, and now we have it. And in one sense, you know, there isn't a reason to, to complicate that discussion, but I think that the way that I would put the question in order to make it um, kind of a, a sharper point is that, of course, there are going to be people who say, well, you know, I want to figure out the past using forensic methods, archaeological methods. And then there are going to be people who say, I'm going to understand the sourcing of the origins of, of these texts through the tradition's own understanding of where they came from. But the question is, can the tradition be aware of the other way of thinking about it? And can it have something to say about it, right? Because there always are, are different ways of sifting data in the present and trying to construct an account of the past. And, and those can be based on different methodologies and they can be useful to varying degrees. And it might be the case that as far as how the Torah wants to treat a subject on its surface, and as far as what our, uh, let's say, observances are in terms of how we talk about the Torah and how we teach about the past, you know, through the lens of the Torah when we're conveying our tradition, and maybe that all of that might be set. And it's still the case that the Torah is given to us in a world where, because there are other methods for sifting data and, and figuring things out about the past, and sometimes they're useful. There are these other kind of questions that 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 linger there. Like when you start kind of trying to step things backwards historically and say, okay, well, a year ago, the reason that we have the Torah written down as it was is because it was being copied from Torahs that existed before that, uh, like Sifre Torah, actual, actual scrolls. And if you go back 10 years, that's still the case. And if you go back 100 years, that's still the case. And, you know, by the time you're going back 1,000 years, um, I believe it's the case maybe that there aren't any Sifre Torah that predate the Crusades just because basically all of them got burned. But it's also not so understand. I mean, it's not so difficult to understand why that would be the case because Sifre Torah are written on parchment, which is made of animal skin. And ultimately, that's not made to be maximally durable, right? We weren't taught to transmit the Torah uh, and stone tablets. Uh, and that has advantages. And maybe you would call it the disadvantage of, of, of things uh, eventually being very hard to preserve, or maybe that's a kind of a, a feature and not a bug, uh, because actually Akados Baruch Hu and, and, and Moshe and, and our tradition intended it for us not to have stone records um, uh, of how the Torah was supposed to be written. But in any case, the point is that the same way that even if you, you just want to you know, pick up the Torah and understand what the world is only from, from what's written there, you still live in a world with fossils and you still live in a world with animals that resemble human beings because they're also primates. And, and these facts about the world raise questions uh, about how to understand the human condition and how to understand the responsibilities of, of an Oved Hashem, um, even if you know, you're not starting in your, your picture of, you know, how to construct the past from the methodology of, of, of forensics or of natural science, paleontology or whatever. Similarly, 
with our understanding of the Torah itself, you could say, okay, if an archaeologist or a historian, so to speak, is to sit down and try to imagine as we walk things back a hundred years, a thousand years, uh, four thousand years, however long we're trying to go back, what is the plausible story of where this all comes from? And is there any understanding of that story um, in our own tradition, like in, in, in the Torah's account of itself? Does it have a message for us about how to think about and how to grapple with that question? Because obviously if you talk to an archaeologist, if you talk to a certain kind of historian, what they would say is, well, if you have a document that's part of a tradition that dates from 3,000 years ago, from however many thousands of years ago, uh, presumably it originated through some gradual uh, sifting and uh, curation and canonization of originally oral traditions that maybe eventually started getting written down and there started being a sort of scriptural practice for how to write them down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually things became more and more and more careful in how they were transmitted and things kind of got fixed and, and set. But that that process in the imagining of any archaeologist would would take some time, right? That it wouldn't be that you would just have the completed document, you know, handed on one day and then for after, ever after, um, it, it's, it's exactly the same. And clearly the, the account of Mahmoud Sinai that we have understands things uh, in, in very different terms. Uh, and, and so that raises the question, well, so is the Torah telling us something that is trying to uh, fly in the face of a, an archaeologist's proposals and say, well, look, the archaeologist thinks this way, but the archaeologist doesn't have the benefit of knowing that sometimes miraculous things can happen. And, and so, you know, we, we're not interested um, in, in what the archaeologist has to say about this because we know something else happened instead. And it's exactly as we imagine it when we read, you know, Parashat Yitro. Or could it be that, you know, that these, these are different accounts of the past and, 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 we somehow see truth in each of them, but you know that the Torah is trying to emphasize one way of understanding it. Like, where is the Torah itself trying to situate itself um, in, in the midst of that? Does it have some kind of examination of what it means for one to know what quote unquote actually happened when a text was written or when it was canonized? And that's something that I, I, I kind of just wanted to pull pull in different sources. Um, and and ask about, and I, I don't know if we'll come to like a complete conclusion about it uh, today, but I do think there are some sources in the Torah that really do start to take up the subject. And before before jumping into and like referring to sources, um, I'll, I'll say that um, a, there, there, there's kind of a, a theological comment that you could make briefly at the outset but I think it's important to this discussion, which is that we often think of uh, there being two options in how we understand what Tanakh is telling us, uh, which is to say that either we read it to be telling us some kind of dry, quote unquote, factual account of what, quote unquote, actually occurred, uh, and in that case, so to speak, if there had been a person there with a video camera taping everything, it would record a set of events just as they're described um, uh, when we're reading the text of Tanakh. Um, or alternatively, it is speaking, uh, again, quote unquote, metaphorically, uh, and something else is what quote unquote actually happened. That dichotomy, I would argue, is a very Western one. It's a very Hellenistic one. It's very much a dichotomy that we learn to set up from the Western enlightenment and its attack on what it understood as biblical religion. And really before that, um, we learn from the uh, ideological contest of Hellenism uh, against uh, a, a biblical way of understanding the world or the, the, the Torah way of understanding the world. Um, and I, I don't think that 
um, we actually have to sort of choose between one of the two horns of, of, of that dilemma. Uh, and, and we have to step back from, from the brink of, of, of being forced to make the choice in that way by all the sort of expectations of, I don't know, uh, Western and, and Greek influenced epistemology and philosophy. Um, but I would also just say that I, I think uh, an easy way out of that dilemma in some sense is just to point out that um, it already, it, it, even within the construct of, of how we understand what the Torah is trying to teach us about the world, if we just take the premise that Akadosh Baruch Hu is king and master of everything, the creator of the world, that he decides everything that happens, it could both be the case that some of what he writes to us in the Torah is meant to teach us a perspective on events that exploits our imagination in some way and isn't necessarily the same thing as you know a video camera trained on the set of events. And yet it could still be the case uh, that he has no difficulty whatsoever making sure that every word of the Torah is written exactly as he would have wanted it, right? Because he's not just the author of the Torah, he's the author of everything. He's the author of the whole world, right? So if he wants every word of war and peace to be exactly this way and for the second edition of it to have a typo in this page, then so it is, right? And, and also, it can both be the case that there might be a forensically plausible historical process that could produce the Torah uh, as it is. And it could also still be the case that we could assert that it has been penned by the hand of the world's creator and, and has uh, the same authority uh, as we would invest it with um, when we more evocatively picture it as being handed to Moshe Rabbeinu on Har Sinai, so to speak. <laughs> So I think a significant point here is that the assertion that Akados Baruch Hu is king and master of the universe and, and, and the, the acceptance that his authorship of everything is unlimited, that means that Tanakh can at times perhaps be speaking to us in a way that describes events so that we comprehend things that are impossible to comprehend or impossible to appreciate unless they are narratively portrayed in a certain way. And yet it can still be the case that the sort of business end of that narrative, the claim that it's making about the outcome, uh, carries the same force, right? So that Hashem's uh, authorship of the Torah really doesn't depend whatsoever on the degree to which the Torah's account of the giving of the Torah is literally coherent with some kind of forensic or archaeological uh, account that we might give. Even if those don't things don't line up, the creator of the world did write the Torah. He wrote every letter of it, right? Because he chose uh, not only those letters, but all the letters everywhere else. Um, and, and the real question, uh, which we've already talked about in some other shiurim, is how can someone in the present day find out for himself that trying to keep this Torah puts him in relationship with the world's creator in a way that he can understand uh, the, the truth of that revelation, that he can understand that the world's creator is trying to reward him for keeping the Torah and punish him for not keeping the Torah and helping uh, Am Yisrael fulfill uh, the destiny described uh, in that Torah. So, so I, I think that's like a, a necessary side at the beginning of this discussion. Um, that being said, I'm also interested in what else we can learn about Torah's understanding itself of the whole question, sort of skeptical question of what it means for there to be transmission of something that was written down and when it was written down, it was given by the hand of the world's creator. But since then, you know, it's been passed from person to person. And how you're supposed to be able to trust in that and what are the kind of concerns you might have um, uh, about that? Because now let's pose this, you know, from the standpoint of a skeptic. Who's, who's going to stipulate 
let's 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 admit, let's allow for the fact that a Kadosh Baruch Hu did give the Torah perfect and whole uh, to Moshe Rabbeinu in Har Sinai. From that point onward, it's been in the hands of people, right? Lo it's not up in heaven. It's it's here on earth with us. It's in our hands. And people are fallible, people are corruptible, people are uh, imperfect, and they've been the custodians of this thing. And, and from that point forward, you know, we we, we have uh, only one small portion of the Torah called Aseret Hadibot, the, the Ten Statements. That part was written in stone. And even within the construct of the Torah, that could actually be broken and had to be reforged or, or re-chiseled. Uh, and then the rest of it is written down in a scroll, which is on animal skin, which is much less uh, durable over time. So you have this process of transmission that there's an oral tradition that only much later was allowed to be written down. There's a written tradition, but the writing is something that could have errors you know, from human hands, et cetera. And, and you just have to kind of ask like, how much are we supposed to trust in the present day in this written thing that we have, even if there's no question about the perfection of what was handed to Moshe? And I, I kind of, in one sense, already gave an answer to this because the first thing I started off with was just saying, well, the thing we have to rely on ultimately is the Ashkechav HaKadosh Baruch meaning that Hashem is in charge of everything and he's actually in charge of all the typographical errors um, and, and the Torah that we have today is the one that he wanted us to have today. Um, and so we don't have to stress too much about, oh, there was a perfect Torah a while ago, and maybe someone, you know, messed this up uh, 2,500 years ago, uh, and and now we're, we're sort of forever bearing the burden of that, and we'll never know. That kind of a worry doesn't really make sense when Hashem is the one steering the whole ship. Um, and, and I think... As an aside, there's even a little bit of a hint of that in the fact that the central mitzvah of the Mikdash, which is to, to perform uh, this Ola Tamid, um, the, the daily sacrifice twice a day, which the sages uh, in one famous passage even agree is sort of the, the mitzvah that stands for all of the Torah. Keves achat ha-seba bokeru ve'et ha-keves ha-shinit ha-seben al-mayim. Right? So you have a, a sheep that you perform and sacrifice in the morning and one in the afternoon. The word kibbis is also sometimes written in the Torah itself as kesiv, um, quite frequently. Uh, and and it, it's, it's, it's quite a shocking thing because um, it looks like some kind of study in, in linguistics or, or uh, the possible errors of, of, of scribes. But of course, it's preserved and it's actually been preserved very carefully for a very long time in such a way that both kevis and kesiv are used uh, to refer to the same animal. And it's kind of calling your attention, like even as you know, you're going to be keeping this mitzvah, this central mitzvah, and it's all about this. You need to know what this word means. And if you know what that word means, it's really because you're part of some oral tradition that created a whole kind of national edifice of trust on which this whole thing was transmitted and conveyed. Um, and, and it is something in human hands, and, and, and that's not to be swept under the rug. So I would argue for the, the non-accidental nature of that slippage between Kevis and Kesev, and that's really trying to call your attention to the fact um, that if this thing is going to work, it's not going to be because we pretend that we have the ability to transmit things perfectly, um, and it's because we have Imunah and Akadosh Baruch Hu that the way things are playing out or the way that he wants it to be. But that was an aside. So now, like uh, diving into actual sources that we can start bringing in that seem to be related to this question of where we get the Torah from, if if we think of it as a historical process, I think the first place that I would I would raise as a possible place to look um, is if we think about okay, what is one piece of the Torah? that we know is described to us more than once in almost verbatim repetition where there are small differences and where this is a moment that is actually about the transmission of the Torah itself and about the question of how durable a record 
we can actually make of that moment of transition. What I'm referring to, of course, is Aseret HaTibrot, the Ten Statements, right? Because Aseret HaTibrot appear first in Parsha Yitro, uh, in Sefer Shemot, when we, we have the giving of the Torah first described in Ma'amad Sinai, But then we have this rehash uh, by Moshe Rabbeinu in Sefer Tvarim, uh, where we're talking about uh, Aseret HaTibrot again, and they're given again, almost verbatim the same, um, in Parshat Vayet Hanan. And it's quite interesting to, to think about that one because we're talking about the stone tablets. The stone tablets are the most durable record, right? It's not the part that's written down in animal skin. It's the part that's chiseled in stone that you think of as this can last forever. And it's it's notable, again, as I mentioned, these stone tablets in Moshe's lifetime get broken, right? So even stone tablets can be broken and you shouldn't make some kind of pesel, some kind of idol, out of the idea that there's like one perfect record of the Torah that could be written down with the hand of Hashem, and then now you're done, and you never have to question, and you never have to think about where it came from. Um, there's a whole lot of examination of that um, uh, making of an idol, in fact, in the background of that story, because the verb used to make a seret adibrot on luchot abrit, on the tablets, is the same verb of the word peset, which is a graven image that Moshe engraved them by psol. Um, and also, while he is involved in, in getting this um, uh, law written and with the finger of God, that's where the people are, are, are making their golden calf and, and, and engaging in idolatry. So it's, it's all you know, wrapped up in this very careful package to show you the dangers of making an idol out of the written word and, and forgetting human involvement in that process. Now let's look at the actual text though. So I, we're not gonna go line, line, line by line through these two sources and they differ in, in a few different ways, but I was taking this particular question or this, this particular issue into looking at the comparison between the text of Aseret HaDibrot and Parshat Yitro and Aseret HaDibrot and Parshat V'Etchanan in Sefer Shmot or in, in, in Sefer Tvarim, the book of Exodus or the book of Deuteronomy. Um, and what you find is there are a few differences. Like, uh, so in many cases, things are exactly the same. Now verbatim, lo tirzach, do, do not murder. And lo tignov, do not steal, right? Um, there is one difference that's very famous, which is in the keeping of Shabbat, that in one case, it's about shmirat Shabbat, keeping Shabbat or guarding it. And in the other case, it's about uh, zichira. It's about remembering Shabbat. Um, so zachor. And, you know, we, we, we put that in the Chadodi, right? Shamo v'zachor b'dibor achad. There's, there's this whole um, discussion in the tradition about what it means to uh, have guarding and remembering Shabbat and that it's like in one utterance that both of those ideas can be captured. But for now, I'll just point out that difference, right? There's one reference to guarding. There's another reference to remembering. Another point that comes up that's different is when it's talking about edut. So witnessing, right? There, there's, a, there's a commandment not to bear false witness. And in one case, being a false witness is described as being an ed sheker, a, a lying witness. Um, and in the other case, it's not the word sheker isn't used. Instead, it's shav, uh, which is also the word um, used in conjunction with the idea of taking the Lord's name in vain. So it's sort of uh, being like trifling with or being um, light or uh, insubstantial uh, with witnessing. Uh, and, and perhaps kind of untruthful or false or uh, faithless or untrustworthy as a result. So why do I think that's interesting? Um, and so I'll say as a side, that's not the full catalog of differences between those two passages. There are only a few others. One, for example, is in uh, the, the final commandment of Lotachmo, don't covet, where there's an additional lotitawe, uh, don't crave. Uh, in addition to coveting, and 
I, I won't involve that in this discussion, although it would be interesting to think of whether it has something to do with it. What I'm interested in is Shamor Zachor and Shekel and Shav with respect to Eidut. Because think of the topic that brought us into this examination. We were thinking about the idea of how can it be that when the Torah is transmitted, that there can be a faithful propagation of that message through the generations in the hands of people. And how do we know that this is really what actually happened, right? That this is how the Torah was actually given. And what are the verbs and sort of adjectives or concepts that are coming up here when we make this side-by-side -side comparison between these two moments where the Torah is being given on stone? Um, and there's little tiny differences. There's kind of little corruptibilities that the Torah itself is introducing into the discussion with this comparison. It's about guarding Shamor, it's about remembering Zachor, and it's about Edut, it's about witnessing, and the possibility of an unfaithful or false witnessing. This is exactly the topic that we're talking about already, right? Where we're, we're asking the question, what would be a convincing and faithful testimony of Mahmoud Sinai, such that I would know, like, okay, this is the this is the correctly copied version of of what was given to Moshe, um, and and how do I um, how do how do I know that? How do I where do I get that confidence from? So I, I think it's marvelous that the Torah itself, as is always the case, it's never going to take a difficult issue like a hard question that you are going to bring to it that is with sincerity being asked because you want to understand better what HaKadosh Baruch Hu is trying to teach you uh, in your mission as an Oved Hashem, it is not going to sweep that under the rug and just say, nothing to see here, folks. You know, the, the, this question has already been answered. Um, we're closed for the day. Goodbye. Right? That kind of you know, hiding behind the curtain in the understanding of our tradition is for all the Abu Dazara that is all about pulling the wool over the eyes of people and, and not accepting um, their, their right to, to ask these hard questions and to gain understanding by grappling with those questions while at the same time insisting on uh, the truth of, of the tradition and insisting on um, the kingship of Akados Baruch Hu, who gave us the Torah. So I find it marvelous that when you actually look, it's, a, it's, it's clear as day. It's talking about, oh, yeah, this is, this is a challenge. How would you uh, verify the proper witnessing and sort of sign sealing and delivering uh, of this message? Um, how would you um, distinguish that from a false message, from a, a false testimony? And what does it mean to, to be a guardian or a rememberer of this law, right? How, how, do you, how do you guard and remember it such that you can bear a true, a true witness to, to, the, to the giving of the Torah at Sinai? So I, I, after building all of that up, I'm not sure that I have um, uh, in this she will the answer to the question that I'm asking as I can extract it from um, the Torah itself. It's clear that the text is aware of this question and that it's raising it. And then I think what I, I can do in the remainder of this discussion is pivot to a few other sources that I think also are, are playing with this idea and that seem to be connected. Um, so one um, other passage that maybe we might want to bring in and this is the one that was, I was thinking about recently because it's in Parshat Vayishlach, um, is this moment where Yitro is, uh, sorry, is this moment where Yaakov Avinu is, is crossing the fort at Yavok. He's just been in Eretz Gilad and has had this whole event with Lavan and getting away from Lavan. And now he's going to have this encounter with Esav. And as he's coming back to the land, He's very scared of Esav. He's crossing the, the Yavok after dividing his camp and all of that. And there's this famous moment where he wrestles with someone. He gets the name Yisrael because he's wrestling. Uh, and there's a very curious moment afterwards where 
in the course of that wrestling, Yaakov is injured in kaf hayireh, in this, what we now in the present anatomical language would call the sciatic nerve, or the muscle around the sciatic nerve, the gid hanashe. He's, he's injured and he's limping, and we're suddenly told, and that's why B'nai Israel don't eat uh, from Gid Hanashe. That's, that's, that's where that mitzvah comes from, that we have in the kashrut of meat that we eat, this restriction that says we do not eat from that part of the animal. Even though the animal as a whole is kasher, we have to separate that part out because we can't eat it. So it says, Al ken lo yochlu v'nei Yisrael et gid hanashe asher al kaf ha'yerech ad hayom haze ki naga'a v'chaf yerech Yaakov v'gid hanashe. So, therefore the people of Israel do not eat of the sinew of the vein, which is in the hollow of the thigh to this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh and the sinew of the vein. The thing that's very curious about this is that we don't have a lot of mitzvot in the Torah that work this way, right? Where there's kind of a just so story for where it came from. So most of the time, if there's a mitzvah that we have in the Torah, it's just that Moshe has given us the Torah, we're reading the Torah, and it says, Hashem and Moshe, something, or just a bunch of mitzvot that we're learning about shatnez, about not mixing wool and linen, or about, you know, that you shouldn't cook a, a kid in its mother's milk. And we just take these and, and we turn them into practical halakha, and, and that's a way to live. This also is part of practical halakha. You're going to do kosher slaughter of an animal, and, and there's a proper way of doing that so that you're not going to accidentally eat from kid and Hashem. But we have this story. Oh, it comes from the life of Yaakov Avinu. And it raises this question. Are there other mitzvot that also come from the life of Yaakov Avinu or from other avot or from other stories? Like, are, are the mitzvot that we have actually kind of a collection of sort of mementos from stories from somewhere in the lives and times of, of Ben Israel? And we get to see that in this instance. But typically, that's not the case. Like, how did this story become a mitzvah? Was it a mitzvah for all of Bnei Israel from this moment afterwards? Or is it just that when Moshe is given this mitzvah, it's referenced to this story, but we only know that because the Torah tells us? Um, and there are some other mitzvot where we could maybe start to draw the connection ourselves, but where the Torah doesn't explicitly say, for example, that when there's a mitzvah talking about a man who has two wives and he prefers one wife over the other, you know, whether or not he can take the son of the, the wife that he prefers and make him the firstborn, you know, that kind of thing. Um, that certainly makes us think of Yaakov and Rachel and Leah, but it doesn't say, oh, and that's why, you know, remember when this happened before, well, now we're, we're changing things. Or where there's a, there are laws about a uh, when and under what circumstances you consider uh, something that happens to be rape. And Dina, the daughter of Yaakov, was out visiting the daughters of the land in Shechem, and, and she got raped. And so you, there, there are instances where you maybe see a resonance, but here it's made very explicit. Um, there are very few other places you would, you would present as a candidate like this one, um, where, where it's kind of, the law is not, the story is not about laws. The story is about wrestling. But still we get a law from the story. That I'm not sure I know of another example in the Torah, or at least not, not one that's as obvious. We do have another place in the Torah um, where we, we do have a law that comes from a story. But there, the story is about laws. Because there's actually... Um, a case where we see how a law gets generated in the life and times of Moshe. So what happens is um, the daughters of Tzlafchad, Benot Tzlafchad, come to Moshe Rabbeinu uh, and they say to him that they're distressed because they're going to lose out on their Nachala, they're going to lose out on their inheritance of Eretz Yisrael because their father Tzlafchad 
had sided with Korach in the big rebellion, and he had gone away along with <coughs> the rebels with Korach. And now they didn't have a patriarch in their family to receive the Nachla, the inheritance in Eretz Yisrael. And so uh, now they're, they feel like they've been robbed because they have this great love of Eretz Yisrael. They want to go there and they want to inherit it. They want to have a land. So what are you supposed to do um, if you don't have a patriarch in your family you know, and he only had daughters? Um, does that mean that the family is sort of out of luck and they, they don't have an inheritance anymore in the land? And Moshe hears their case. And seemingly on the spot, we have new halacha that has to do with the case of a man who dies who only had daughters and what happens in that case with the inheritance of land. And then there's a follow-on to that because later from the tribe of the daughters of Tzavchad, um, which are the men of Menashe, they're saying, well, but there's still a problem here because now, okay, you, you created a solution. The solution was that not Safchad get to inherit, even though they're women. But now when they go marry, what if they marry men from other Shvatim, from other tribes? Then the land that they inherited will go into the holdings of their husband's patriarchy. And as a result, will lose land from the tribe of Menashe and it will go irreversibly into the hands of some other tribe. And so then we create this additional solution where there's another law that says, okay, so if you are a daughter who's inheriting in this way of Benot Slavchad, then you have to marry men who are from your tribe because that way there's no problem, right? The land will stay in the tribe. So that set of vignettes, we were hearing a story that's actually about the making of laws in the time of Moshe Rabbeinu. And it's very explicit. So there's a there's a narrative, but the narrative is about people who ask questions about laws and rulings that get made about laws and the laws that get created as a result. Um, and we're, we're seeing a, kind of in real time uh, a, a judicial process where Moshe is almost acting like a court or a judge who's making a ruling, but then the ruling becomes the law that others follow afterwards. Uh, and, and so we have these different pieces now. There's there's Mamad Sinai, which is kind of, you know, we're looking at the, the, the Ten Commandments or the Ten Statements and, and Luchot Abrit, there's this sense of some direct suggestion that there is a question about, you know, what does it mean for, for all of us to be properly witnessed and, and signed, so to speak? How do we know how to trust it? What does it mean that we, we keep it and guard it? And then we go look elsewhere. There are these specific narrative elements that seem to be about how mitzvot in the Torah get created. In one case, in the life of Yaakov, from a kind of a, a story about wrestling that seems to have nothing to do with laws. And in another case, um, about Benot Tzavchad and, and, and the actual uh, arguments made before a court, so to speak, about what should be done? And, and there's a question now of what it all adds up to. And I think that there's a theme that runs through all of these different points in the Torah that's that's telling us something about how to understand this. And I, I'm not sure, again, that I'm going I'm to get all the way to a conclusion. But they're all about daughters, actually. And... I didn't emphasize that in the first two sources I was talking about because they're just a little bit in the background. But Parshat Yitro, when the Torah is first given, it's about Yitro coming to see Moshe. Um, and, and who is Moshe? Moshe is the son-in-law of, of Yitro. He's married to Tzipora, uh, who is the Bat Midian, the daughter of Midian, um, that Moshe met when he first came to Midian. And Yitro plays an important role, right? He isn't just Moshe's father-in-law. He also sees Moshe sitting in judgment over everyone all the time and says, you can't possibly do this. You can't just judge every case yourself. No, you're a human being. No one is going to you know, be able to do that forever. You need to delegate. You need to create a structure, a legal system where you have levels of judgment, you know, people who can decide cases for different numbers of people, 
Um, and, and, and you need to establish, I don't know if you would call it a, a Rabbanut, but some kind of judicial system, of, whether it's the Sanhedrin, whether it's um, Batedin, whatever you want to call them. Um, there has to be some level of uh, delegation to many human beings to make decisions. And interestingly, that is kind of the beginning of Mahmoud Har Sinai. Like we, we think of Parashat Yitro as being a big deal because it's about the giving of the Torah. And we're so eager to see that when we're reading it that we just are like, oh, Yitro, what are, what are you doing here? Okay, talk to Moshe. We'll get that over with. And then the fireworks, you know, then the smoke and, and the, the, the thunderclaps and all of the encounter with the Baruch Hu. But we can also be asking the question, is the Torah trying to show us in some sense that the beginning of that process was the establishment of a legal system at Yitro's recommendation? That at some level, Moshe, by involving the nation in legal judgment and figuring out how to develop a system in order to make that happen, that that was somehow the trigger for the giving of the Torah, as it then is described. And the Torah wants to tell us about the giving of the law as this singular moment where something made of stone is being handed by a Kadosh Baruch Hu to Moshe. But it, at the same time, juxtaposes that with the initiation of a process that perhaps could develop a kind of a common law uh, relationship to judgment um, that might kind of produce the raw material for, you know, what are we going to actually codify into laws? What's going to become this kind of a law or that kind of a law? So that's the first point. But I, I mentioned the daughter, Tipora, because she is there in the background at that moment. But these other statements that we were, the other, the other places we were talking about involve daughters too. Obviously, Benot Slavchat is about daughters. That's the one where it's obvious. They're daughters and, and their daughterhood is pushed to the fore. Um, but where else do we do we see daughters? We also have daughters um, in the case of Yaakov wrestling, right? Because the whole thing that just happened right beforehand was his encounter with Levan, where he's trying to get away from Levan by taking Levan's daughters, Leah and Rachel, his wives, away from Levan and having this whole argument about whether it all belongs to Levan or not. And there's kind of this disputation that needs judgment. And that where where he and Levan are invoking the idea of judgment, you know that that Levan is is calling for judgment between them. Um, they are they have a, a dispute. They're trying to resolve nonviolently, because although Levan is a wicked guy, these are all his family, and he's a little bit less inclined maybe to just kill them all just because they ran away from him. But he's on the brink of that. And, and we're trying to set up a situation where people can resolve a very uh, severe dispute w without violence. And it comes in the end to the, the, the erection of this stone plinth uh, that um, Yaakov and, and Levan built together that Yaakov calls Gal Ed, which, which becomes the name of this region, Gilad, um, but which... Um, <clears throat> which Levan calls by an Aramaic name, the word Zahaduta in it, that uh, it's something else. And, and so, but Gal Ed is, you know, it's a Gal, it's a pile of stones that is an Ed, that's a witness. So it's again, this idea of stones and witnessing and which connects back to what we were saying about Serhat and Adibrot and the stone tablets. And it's kind of trying to show you a bit of, of what the value of law is, that it, it gives, both parties to a dispute, something that they can point to and say, like, this is the boundary. And they can each kind of regard it differently and give it a different name, but at least like they, there's something concrete that they both can accept the, the significance of that uh, allows for some kind of uh, judgment or, or parting between them. And that moment is, is full of the idea of daughters. Um, Another detail here, now that we are, 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 are coming onto it, is that this happens in the same place, basically, as the story with Benot Slavchad. 
because everything um, that we're talking about in that period in the Torah is about this moment right before everyone enters into the land. And so it all has to do with Eretz Gilad, which is this land on the east of the Yorden, uh, where they had conquered the land from Sichon and <clears throat> Og um, and, and the Amori, um, and they were getting ready to go into the land. And there's repeated mentions of uh, Gilad and Nachal Arnon and Yavok. And Yavok is the same place where Yaakov is, is crossing, you know, when he's wrestling. So those two moments are actually also being geographically juxtaposed in the Torah. Um, and, and we're being told they have to do with each other. Um, so really, I think the, the structure that we're grabbing onto with this idea of, of daughters and judgment, it gets even more complicated and intricate. Lot is another person we might think of who has daughters. And when he is trying to offer his daughters to the mob in stone, um, the sodomites are angry with him and saying, oh, you know, uh, you, you're trying to judge us uh, and, and accusing him uh, of acting in judgment over them. So the idea of judgment and daughters, again, is coming up there. Um, and ultimately, B'nai Amon, the Ammonites, are inhabiting that same region of Eretz Gilad. And B'nai Amon came from Lot's uh, incestuous congress with his daughter. So I think there's a larger structure of different related passages, passages here that we can really um, dig into all in, in this discussion. But I think that if I would try to sort of uh, to, to step back from what we've observed now that we're, we, we, we see um, a repeated connection between daughters and judgment uh, and law, uh, on the one hand, and, and kind of the question of the creation of the Torah or the creation of mitzvot, um, uh, and, and and the giving of the Torah at Har Sinai, I wouldn't say I have a, a complete, neatly tied up conclusion uh, about these separate observations to make here, uh, but I will say that it's striking that because of this geographic association with Eretz Gilad and the wrestling of Yaakov, uh, we, we have happening in, in, in this place where it's about crossing the Jordan and coming back into Eretz Yisrael. It's striking that in the end, that means also that this has to do with where Moshe gets left behind and why he can't come into the land. Uh, because I think that if you look at the episode with Benot Zavchad, the daughters of Tzlavchat, um, there is, there is a, a, a clear sense that we're seeing the process in action, right? That Moshe is there, people who have legitimate claims to bring are there, Moshe makes a judgment. And when Moshe consults like Adosh Baruch Hu and then makes a judgment, that is the law. That's like the giving of the Torah. It becomes Torah. So when you have Moshe around, when you ask a question and you get an answer, it's like a new line in the Torah. Um, and, and, and now you're kind of stuck with another law that's like eternal and um, uh, forever part of this uh, set of rules that constrain the way Am Yisrael have to live. And if you think of Moshe in those terms, it's very dangerous to keep him around because he'll just keep on answering questions and, and we'll keep on accumulating laws that we are, are completely uh, dictated by Akados Baruch Hu. And it's not clear necessarily that the goal is just to have more and more laws and rules and constraints forever and ever, but rather more that we have enough, that we you know have something to go on and then Hashem wants us to live and, and to be free, to have the chirut, uh, to be his his free servants who, who find the only freedom there is to have in the world by serving him um, uh, according to his Torah. And, and so I, I think part of the commentary that we're seeing here by the Torah itself is that there may be an element of, perhaps there is some version of a story of, of where Torah comes from that has to do with 
uh, the development of a legal system that's capable of making judgments that combine with the idea of divine authority. Uh, but the point is that that, first of all, isn't the way the Torah wants to summarize where it came from. The way the Torah wants to summarize where it came from is to tell us about Ma'amad Sinai and Moshe going up the mountain um, and getting it from the hand of Hashem and writing it down. Uh, and, and also, um, it's being hinted to us that uh, there, there, there might be something in that process that had to stop and that we we think of that as being associated in a sense with the death of Moshe Rabbeinu, that he couldn't enter the land, that he had to be removed from the picture because there was something problematic about uh, his his staying around as a lawmaker with a, a direct line to Akadosh Baruch Hu. Uh, and the, at the at the end of the day, we have to treat this all as being a bit of a a, a mysterious. Uh, process that ultimately wasn't captured on camera and where we have to focus our efforts on understanding it on the the accounts that the Torah gives us of of, of how it happened and that when, when we when we think of this in terms of Yaakov Avinu wrestling at Yavok and you know the mitzvah coming from the story of his life that there's something very secret and very kind of uh off camera or more mysterious about this moment where he's wrestling and we're told that this mitzvah comes from the, this moment where Yaakov was wrestling and and that part of the Torah is coming to us on the one hand to say that this is the moment when Yaakov is named Yisrael and Yisrael means that he's wrestling with man and with God and and that emblematic struggle of, of trying to figure it all out and sort of grabbing on and not letting go, in one sense, is the relationship to Borei Olam, to the creator of the world, that's capable of producing laws like we have in our Torah, right? But even if that is the case to some degree, even if what we're being shown by the Torah to some degree is that the Torah itself comes from uh, perhaps the sort of the personal struggles of our forefathers with Akados Baruch Hu and with the world that they lived in, trying to figure it out and put it all together. Uh, that has to be a, a, a kind of a, a process that is mostly mysterious and strange to us, where we don't even really know whom he was wrestling with and he's alone and it's at night and there are no witnesses and that can't be the 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 version of the story to which we ultimately can bear the best witness and so if we're going to talk about um the the version of, of offense that to which we can bear witness we talk about mama Sinai, and, and we're we're given tremendous vivid detail about what that was like uh, in the torah itself uh, and and uh, those details maybe you know are, are there also to teach us things about uh, the nature of these laws and 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 what Akados Baruch Hu intends for us with them. So I'll, I'll finish there, and I'll fully admit that that was um, uh, an argument constructed from partially analyzed material, and there may be more conclusions that I'll come to about what some of it means as time passes. But I do think that um, these passages are definitely related to this question and that there's enough grist for the mill already to have a conversation. I was thinking when you were talking about Zachor and Shamor and the Eidut that it really works perhaps in a parallel manner that in a sense Hashem is, uh, always remembers us and he also, he, he preserves um, his covenant with us over the generations and he remembers us and we at the same time are remembering what he's giving us and and preserving the tradition that he's given us and that's also and that i mean i'm not the the part that connects to our, our part of that of the shamar with the is 
is, is uh, um, connects to the pr preservation of the the, the um, Torah scrolls as they've come down through the generations. Yeah, that that makes me think of um, a related point, which is that there are these verbs that we think of in the Torah as being very mental, like remembering, um, and lots of other ones as well, that somehow their primary meaning seems to be psychological. Where in the Lashon of the Torah, it's always, and, and, and also in Halakha, et cetera, that there's always this sense of they actually have to have an accompanying action, right? Like knowing something can't be something that you just do by sitting and cognizing that when someone in the Torah says, Atta yadati, like now I know, what they mean is, now I know because some fact has been accomplished, some action has been taken, and there is no substitute for the knowledge of experience, and I have just experienced the thing that's happened. So when, when Akedos Baruch Hu's Malach says to Avraham after the Akedah, to the binding of Isaac, now I know that you, you know, fear God. It wasn't the case that Hashem didn't know what emotions or attitudes Abraham had beforehand. It's that there's no such thing as of knowledge without a kind of a carnal aspect, a, a, a physically instantiated aspect. And the physically instantiated aspect of Abraham's Yirat Elohim was that he did this. And now that he did it, there's something for Hashem to know that couldn't be known before. Um, and similarly with, with the verb of zahor, like remembering Shabbat. When we remember Shabbat, what do we do? We make Kiddush, right? So you can't just say, oh, yes, I remember Shabbat. I, I thought about it and I remembered the number seven or something. You have to perform actions. You make a bracha, you drink wine, you talk about things while doing things. And that's how we actually remember things. So remembrance is this very active process that we do with um, our hands as well as our, our brains uh, in, in Aracha and in Torah. And, and that, I think, getting back to what you're saying with the idea of Hashem remembering us, that also is very much the case in, in Sefer Shemot, right? You know, v'zacharti et briti, like... And when Hashem says, I will remember my covenant, the point is that we're not saying he forgot previously, like, oh, you know, he was distracted, so to speak, you know, chas uh, shalom, and, 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 and it slipped his mind that he had made this promise. Um, uh, we, we wouldn't say that, uh, <clears throat> because we would say, rather than Agados Baruch Hu, is never less aware of all the things that he knows. But if he's not remembering something yet in the lesson of the Torah, it's because he's not currently doing the thing about it that shows that he remembers, right? That it's about our seeing him remembering. So when he says, and I will remember a breed, right? He's saying like, now you will see that I remember this breed because we're going to see a whole bunch of things happening in Mitzrayim that show that I'm here and I remember what I promised because I'm fulfilling that promise. And so I, I, I think that um, I, I, I'm, I'm agreeing with your, your observation that um, there's this sort of parallel between we have this job of zikhira of remembering, or zikaron, all those different memory activities, um, but also Akados Baruch Hu fulfills his side of the bargain with, with remembering us. And, and in both cases, it's really about actions that ultimately fulfill a promise. Uh, and in his case, that promise would be to preserve us, <laughs> among other things, right? Like the, 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 the sort of the Shmirat part, that we are frail, finite number of human beings. And it seems like that means that Am Yisrael could just by chance kind of disappear from the universe one day, just because like too many accidents happened on the same day. But the promise of HaKadosh Baruch Hu is that 
he always remembers us enough that he will preserve us and will preserve amongst us enough of our tradition that we have the opportunity to fulfill our responsibilities to him and continue to earn uh, that shmirah. Yeah, I think maybe another way of putting what I was trying to say is that if we're talking about the validity, if you want to use the word in, in reference to uh, the Torah we have in our hands today, well, Hashem is remembering, his remembering is, is, is the reference point is to the Torah scroll we have. And, and, the, and our remembering is the same thing. So in a sense, we're both remembering the same thing and sort of propping up in a certain sense that Torah scroll we have as being valid. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I think that this is a very delicate issue because I, I wouldn't say that we learn nothing at all from archaeology about how to keep the Torah. But we do have to be very careful about that because at some level, um, you know, if, if, if a very sort of absurd philosophical skeptic wanted to say, what if the word kevis actually means iguana, but you just all forgot that? And at some point there is this big sort of um, mistake in transmission that happened 1700 years ago. And all the people who knew that kevis meant iguana died out and there was a sect of heretics who thought it meant sheep and they were the ones who survived and now like everyone thinks that we're supposed to be sacrificing sheep on Arabite when really it should be iguanas you know if, if someone wanted to, to to make that kind of a, an absurdist skeptical proposal the answer to that I think is never going to be no we've we've looked carefully at this issue and we are a hundred percent certain of everything that happened in the past um, and and now we're not worried about that anymore. There always is uncertainty about what happened in the past. So you need an attitude about how to do uh, the right thing in terms of halakha that is insulated against that kind of a critique. And I think the way that it works is to say, lo me. the Torah is not up in heaven. It's not something that is written down perfectly up in heaven. And you know we hope that our copy matches it. Um, it, we have the copy of the Torah here on earth um, that we're working with and, and, and we always have to work with what we currently have. Um, so uh, in, in the most recent version of this discussion, I, I've been fascinated by the, the mitzvah chalet in, in um, tzitzit, right? Because we have, we have these um, threads in tzitzit that are uh, dyed to be azure or blue instead of the white ones, and the blue ones, or the azure ones, the trelet ones, you need to dye them according to a specific procedure of extraction of a dye from a particular mollusk. And as, as we know, the knowledge of what mollusk that was was lost for a long time to <clears throat> religious Jews because most religious Jews were not living in a part of the world where they had access to that ecosystem where they could find the mollusk and use it, the chilazon. Um, and that's knowledge that's been rediscovered in the present era now that we've returned to the land. And it raises the question, well, how sure are you? Are they, you know, was it this mollusk or was it another one? Um, maybe you found a mollusk that just has enough properties that resemble that of the mollusk, the, the, the chilazon that was described by Chazan. But since you never can really be totally sure, maybe you shouldn't be wearing chalet, and we never can, can rediscover that. And what I'm so struck by is that the Torah itself anticipates this conversation because what do we say about the tzitzit? In, in Kriyat Shema, we read, tzitzit, or oto, et kol mitzvot Adonai So you, you look at the tzitzit and you see them and you remember all the mitzvot of Hashem and you do them. That the the tzitzit are anticipated as an instance where there's a kind of technical knowledge that could be partly lost and also regained. And that that's how we should be relating to all the mitzvot of the Torah, right? Uh, that 
the Torah is not something where we, we say, well, because we no longer have certain kinds of knowledge um, for 100% certain that exactly line up with what they were doing in the time of Shlomo HaMelech, let's say, um, we therefore can't do these things ever again until uh, essentially some kind of otherworldly end of day scenario. Because that is a kind of argument that's not just made about tzitzit and about tchelet, but really about a lot, broad swath of things to do with the Mikdash, right? That there's too much in the lost knowledge and therefore we can't bring it back to life uh, because there's no trustworthy way of regaining that knowledge when the chain of tradition has been broken. But I think tzitzit lights the way and the Torah teaches us that tzitzit lights the way, that we can remember all the mitzvot of Hashem um, because lo bashamayimhi, because and because zichira is not just oh I, I I had forgotten but now I remember that you know this is how you you do this or this is how you do that that it's about remembrance through action and and it's about uh, in in some cases a sort of a rediscovery or a a return of attention to something that seemed to have been forgotten which also is the case when HaKadosh Baruch Hu was talking about remembering his breed, because for centuries of slavery in Mitzrayim, B'nai Yisrael must have felt like he had not remembered and that he had forgotten. But I was, th- I was inspired while I was listening to what you were saying about Tchelet, because what came to mind is what we see very often nowadays is a very high correlation between the people who wear Tchelet and go up to the Temple Mount. Mm-hmm. And I see there's a concept, there's a, there's a conceptual uh, parallel beyond of what I might have thought about in the past, which is that that process of rediscovery that you were just talking about, that the tailored was rediscovered and we had the belief that we could rediscover it and, and, and that it is something that can be done and we did it. The same thing ultimately is going to happen regarding the Temple Mount, where that which some might assume either never existed or would never come back is going to be rediscovered as a result of our efforts, both thought, both in, th- in thought and in action. Yeah, and, and I think the point is that when that happens, Pesrat Hashem, as long as we are being careful and scholarly and doing the best job we possibly can at understanding the requirements of the Torah. And I think Rav Baruch Chaim obviously is a great leader uh, in, in that kind of a pursuit uh, where we, we have to take it all very seriously and, and go to all the sources and, and, and do the best that we possibly can to understand what we're being taught. But once we do that, I'm not worried that the result that we come up with when we finally decide, okay, this is what we have, so let's do it is going to be, in fact, not correct because it's not the way that they actually did it in the time of Rabbi Akiva or in the time of Shlomo HaMelech or in the time of Moshe Rabbeinu. Because again, and what we end up doing, if we do it with the right kavana and if we do it l'shem shamayim and if we do it with the vast resources of Torah and Talmud that we have to study, that will be the way to do it that HaKadosh Baruch Hu intends us to do it. And in a sense, it's an irrelevant question and an epistemologically almost meaningless one uh, to imagine a world we cannot access uh, that is eons ago and of which we have very little material evidence to imagine that there's a perfect and correct way of it being done that we either are matching or are not matching. Um, And since we can never know that we're matching it perfectly, then we shouldn't do something. I would rather say instead, lo he, and uzachautam et kol mitzvot Adonai v'asitem otam, you should remember all the mitzvot of Hashem and do them. Um, and that just like with Tcheret, we can do that with all the other mitzvot, and that when we're doing them with the right kavanah and with study and with, with you know, care and intention, we will be doing them the way HaKadosh Baruch Hu intends us to do them, the same way we're reading the letters of the Torah that he wrote with his hand, the way that he intended, uh, regardless of, of whatever uh, process and girsot or whatever else and copying happened over the eons. 
I was also thinking of another idea. I'm not exactly sure if this is a correct idea, that the type of question and answer process that happened with the Benot Salafchad and other cases which you mentioned, that in a sense, perhaps it can be seen as a type of quasi, quote unquote, Torah Shebaal Peh, which, which then became Torah Shebechtav, and it's, maybe it's, there's a message there, which is also contained within Yitro, which talks about the Sanhedrin and the Batedin. We know that the Rambam says that the focal point of the Torah Shebaal Peh is the decisions of the Sanhedrin. Mm-hmm. So in, in, in a sense, maybe it all ties together that the, uh, these examples of these quasi, examples of quasi Torah Shebaal Peh that you cited could be seen as uh, leading the way, so to speak, and showing what that that ultimately there'll be a certain type of question and answer process via the Bate Din, which also is a, is a source of uh, Torah. Yeah, no, I, I think it is interesting to wonder whether, in the case of Benot Zafchad, we're kind of being shown. Um, what it could be like to have, like you say, Torah Shabbat Peh be generated by a judicial process. But I, I do think part of the point there is that the problem is as long as Moshe Rabbeinu is in the picture, you have this, this issue where it, it isn't just, he isn't quote unquote just Chazal who have an opinion who get that gets recorded where you know, uh, Shmuel says one thing and Rava says another. He's Moshe Rabbeinu. So if you if you got in front of the boss, uh, and you know, Akadosh Baruch Hu is is the boss, but if if you via Moshe get to really bring it directly before him, and you still have that working process, um, then uh, you you have written another line in the Torah, and uh, that's. I, I think I, I noticed that also because at the moment where Kadosh Baruch Hu is telling Moshe that he can't go into the land, this might also be in Moshe Ved Hanan, um, the, the same verb that's used to say about the Torah itself, don't add to the Torah, like Leosif, is also used where Hashem is saying to Moshe, like, enough, stop asking to go into the land. Right, it, that, it's it's actually very fascinating, and I never, I don't know if I ever thought of that, but I think you're touching on something extremely fascinating, which is that, on some level, if Moshe Rabbeinu had not died when he died, then in a sense there'd be some type of confusion. When does the Torah Shabbatav end? Mm-hmm. When does the Torah end? In other words, is it continuing onwards because now you're coming into Eretz Yisrael, or at some point? There has to be a, a a demarcation, and this was the demarcation that was deemed correct. Yeah, and and there were other elements of that demarcation, right? Because it was also an end to the man, like the the food that they ate in the midbar. The midbar was this kind of operating system level existence. Uh, that is otherworldly, right? Where you get water from a rock and you get man and Moshe and Oyan Moed are right there and everything is bare bones. You know, direct relationship with the Kadosh Baruch Hu and a, an existence in this world that is almost lifted right out of it because of how not constrained by the usual material constraints of this world it is. And all of that comes to an end. Um, as they're going into the land, right? That they, they, they stop eating the man, they stop getting water um, from, and, and I mean, we all know that there's this association uh, between Moshe being told he can't go into the land and the fact that he's still giving them water out of a rock. Um, and obviously that's a complicated episode in its own right. But yeah, I think that um, the... The idea that you can bring questions directly before Hakados Baruch Hu and just get a straight answer and then say, well, now that we have our answer, that's more um, so to speak, handed to us 
from Hashem, that there's something that's clearly dangerous and um, ultimately not healthy about that. Uh, and I, I, I think that um, the, 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 the ultimate engagement with that issue that is, you, you famously see in the Gemara, where this pasuk of Loba Shemaim, he's being uh, quoted in this argument about the, the kashrut of an oven, um, where, um, is it Hukanos, uh, ben, ben Hukanos? The, 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 I, I, there are different sages who are arguing, and one of them is asking for all of these miracles and heavenly voices to agree with him. And the point is that he gets all of the miracles, you know, the, the, the walls to shake and, 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 and the heavenly voice and everything, and yet it's still the case that we go, Halacha goes with the other guy because lo shamaimi, and that's where we have Akados Baruch Hu saying Nitzchoni Banai, like my, my sons have, have defeated me, that there, there's, Hashem doesn't want to, to just tell us what to do, <laughs> and, and, you know, on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. Like, someone who very naively uh, has the kavana of an Oved Hashem where he says, I just want to do what Akados Baruch Hu wants me to do, so what I'd really like is just to be able to check every 30 milliseconds if I'm doing what the Kedosh Baruch Hu wants me to do, and I'll, you know, I'll get the direct instruction, and I'll do that. Wanting to just sort of be a robot or a marionette, when Hashem makes you do what you want, or rather what he wants, that desire on the part of a naive of Hashem is misplaced. That's not what the Kedosh Baruch Hu wants. That's not real Avodat Hashem. Avodat Hashem of the kind that Akados Baruch Hu clearly desires is much more difficult than that because what it requires is being individuals who are capable of mistakes and capable of incorrect apprehensions and capable of being drawn in different directions by desires, figure out how to understand enough about what Akados Baruch Hu wants by studying the Torah that they can then consciously choose to do what they think he wants and get it right sometimes, and then get it right more and more and more as time goes on because they're getting better at it. Clearly, I those Baruch who wants that from us, and the problem is that that's a very sort of error-prone um, situation, uh, but uh, he doesn't want us instead to just be, in a sense, unconscious materials or blind marionettes that just sort of twitch in whatever direction he makes us twitch in and, and then calls that the uh the, the success of of, of service of, of that would be successful service of paro to only do you know with each little fractional motion of a finger like exactly what paro wants what hashem is trying to do is trying to show how serving him involves this kind of radical freedom where successful service of HaKadosh Baruch Hu must involve this free choice to, to, to uh, figure out how to understand and know and love him and fear him in the right way so that you get it right. And so again, this thing with Moshe going into land and like continually making new rulings to tell people, you know, you can't do this. Uh, the, the, the doorway in your house should be this much taller because I asked HaKadosh Baruch Hu and he told me, that kind of rigid constraint and that kind of blind obedience is not what Hashem is going for, seemingly. Also, the robotic, uh, that type of robotic situation would also uh, militate against the whole purpose of the world, which is to uh, have Hashem's glory in a physical world, not just in some angelic world where everything is done automatically the second Hashem says to in, 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 in that type of robotic manner that you're saying that it in other words the the combination of here physical world with free choice melds better with uh, the type of situation which which emerged as opposed to uh, the situation that would have uh, can would have existed had um, Things developed uh, differently. Mm -hmm. Is the oven of Achnai? Ah, okay, yeah. 
But Ben Horkinos is one of the people arguing, right? I think it's it, Achnai is the, the, the name of the Rabbi, of the Rabbi Eliezer Ben Horkinos is one of the uh, yeah. yeah, and the the uh, Rabbi the Nasi Rabbi Gamliel was arguing yeah, uh, right. that the oven was impure. Hmm. In any case, I um, want to encourage uh, any viewers who find that found this conversation and these hearing as fascinating as I find them to be to submit questions. You can uh, submit questions or suggestions for future shirim in the comment in, in the comment section, and uh, just maybe we'll touch on some of those things in the future. That's a so, uh, thank you very much, Doctor England. Thank you. Good night. So, uh, good night. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. If you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org.